Good evening. It's great to see you all. Uh, my name is Mike Alexander. I'm honored to be the Chancellor of the University of Wisconsin Green Bay, and we were thrilled to have you here tonight. Before we start, just a few things uh, to say and a few people to thank. Uh, so first, I, I do want to thank uh, the Tommy Thompson Center. Uh, one of my great uh, joys uh, was to be able to work uh, for Governor Thompson uh, for a little over two years. And uh, it's, it's really amazing anytime we get to uh, interact at all with anything that he has done and to create the Tommy Thompson Center and to have the ability for the center to send us amazing speakers uh, is a terrific, terrific thing and a great service uh, to the state. Uh, also, I just want to mention that uh, we're really excited uh, to invite our community here tonight. I was just having a quick conversation before. I will say that uh, one, of the, one of our primary goals at UW Green Bay is to be engaged with our community. And it's great to see so many members of our community here tonight, uh, to be able to, uh, to, to hear ideas, to think about them. And as a university, we should be the principal marketplace for ideas. We should be a place where people can come to hear ideas, to think about them, to converse about them, uh, and to do so in a completely neutral fashion as a university. Right? Our job is simply to bring people with ideas to the university and let them present those ideas. And we're thrilled to be able to do that and uh, from all perspectives. So we want to thank you uh, very much for being here tonight. Uh, we're really proud of the direction UW Green Bay is going and how we interact with our community and how we interact uh, with, with the, uh, to be able to do things like the uh, interact with the Tommy Thompson Center. So with that, I'm very pleased uh, to introduce Alex Tock uh, from the Tommy Thompson Center to get us ready for our speaker tonight. Thanks for being here. Good evening. Uh, I'm Alex Tock. I'm the director of the Tommy G. Thompson Center on Public Leadership. And the Thompson Center is really delighted to be able to bring uh, Dave Rubin here to Green Bay tonight. Uh, I want to thank Dave and Dean for taking part in tonight's event, uh, Chancellor Alexander and everybody here at UW Green Bay for helping make this happen, as well as Ruth and Mary Kate at the Thompson Center for all their work uh, in putting together tonight's event. Uh, the Thompson Center was founded to follow in the footsteps of Governor Thompson, who proudly worked with colleagues on both sides of the aisle to advance the public good. The Thompson Center was founded to carry on Governor Thompson's legacy by informing and inspiring current and future public leaders, fostering leadership skills, and advancing effective public policy. To carry on this mission, we offer events, uh, fund scholarships and research grants, and conduct other activities across the UW system. It's my pleasure tonight to introduce tonight's moderator, Dean Stensberg. Dean has a long and illustrious career in Wisconsin politics. He began his career as a legislative aide in the Wisconsin Assembly before joining the Go Governor Thompson's executive office staff in 1998, serving as special assistant to the governor. Among Dean's many positions since that time are executive assistant at the Department of Corrections, director of public affairs and policy at the Department of Justice, executive assistant to the Attorney General, chairman of the Wisconsin Parole Commission, executive assistant to Chief Justice Patience Rogensack of the Wisconsin Supreme Court, and chief of staff to Tommy Thompson during his recent tenure as UW System President. Finally, we are proud to have Dean as a member of the Public Leadership Board at the Tommy G. Thompson Center on Public Leadership. Please welcome Dean Stensberg. Am I going or are we gonna sit down? We're, we're gonna sit. Okay. Hello, everyone. I was told to sit. <laughs> I'm sitting. Yeah, <laughs> oh my God, it works. Well, thank you very much. Oh my. <laughs> this is going to be a great night. Yeah, I, well, I haven't fallen out of the chair yet, so I'm feeling good. For those of you who know me, I haven't had a drink yet. Yeah. <laughs> well, it is really wonderful to be here at Green Bay. Um, 
we're at a place where uh, the chancellor that you've got at this institution uh, that is leading both the institution here and working in the community is probably one of the finest public servants I've ever met. Um, just a remarkable guy. He's working his heart out. And not only is he working his heart out, but there are real, genuine results here on this campus and across the Green Bay community and every place this campus touches. So you've got a real gem with Mike Alexander. Um, and speaking of gems, we, uh, we're very lucky. As Alex said, um, one of the things that the Thompson Center does in its leadership efforts to try to model our wonderful governor who gives his regards, I think he's in Elroy tonight. Anybody know where Elroy is? Yeah, between Kendall and Union Center, North of Waniwak and South of Hustler. <laughs> it's a great place. Um, he sends his regards. Um, so one of the things that was really important to him was to try to provide a diversity of viewpoints. And as the board, we sort of looked around to see how we could do that. And I'm not one for animating too many ideas, but I did animate one idea and it was to bring Dave Rubin to Wisconsin to share his thinking, his views, literally how he frames the things he thinks about and why they matter to him and why they should matter to us. And I couldn't be more tickled to have him here with us tonight here in Green Bay. So if you'd give him a wonderful welcome. <laughs> This is kind of fun. I never had a microphone before. <laughs> the governor said I was going to have a nice time. I, I didn't know if I'd have known this 40 years ago, that my life might have been really different. I'm used to standing back there. Oh, it's addicting, man. You're yeah. going to be in a lot of trouble. <laughs> I, I want to offer you to uh, offer you an opportunity just to you know give your greetings to these folks and and spend a little time talking to them, and then I've got I've got a basket of questions that I think we can march through. Sure. Well, first off, it's a pleasure to be here. You know, obviously, after the last couple of years of COVID and the craziness that uh, we've been going through as a as a country and really as a as a planet Earth, I suppose, uh, I haven't been doing much traveling. The one the one big thing that I did in the last couple of years was I moved from crazy Los Angeles, California, to the free state of Florida about 15 months ago. <laughs> I will tell the governor that in Wisconsin, they applaud Florida. That is good. <laughs> that is good. And really, that move, uh, I think, sort of exemplifies everything that I'm going to talk about up here tonight, uh, that you have a chance in this country still to live in a place that lines up with your values, the things you care about, uh, the type of people that you want to live around. Uh, and, and that is a really rare and special thing that most other countries don't have. You know, if you live in Canada, whether you live in Toronto or Calgary, doesn't really matter that much. There's a little bit of differences, there's some weather differences, things like that, but you don't have a full on other government. And we created this incredible, really incredible system here, this federalist system in the United States that allows us to do this. And you guys can make choices for yourself in Wisconsin and, you know, they can make different choices in Illinois, and we can make different choices in Florida and California, et cetera, et cetera, and we get that never-ending experiment. And I think if, if I've done anything right in the last couple of years, at least since, uh, since the public part of this kind of caught fire, it's that I was just very open to that. The idea that, you know what, it's okay if people want to live a little bit differently than you, and they want to make choices that are different, and, and live in a way that's actually completely differently than you, as long as they you know, don't infringe on your rights and things of that nature. And that, I think, is the challenge that we're up against right now because we seem to be facing, through however you want to describe it, either progressivism or wokeism, collectivism, socialism, uh, we seem to be facing a movement that actually wants to erase that. It wants to erase our ability to have choice and to think differently. Uh, and I love the phrase that you used, I use it often, uh, viewpoint diversity. That it really is okay, you know, colleges used to be places where you'd learn to debate, you'd learn how to think, not what to think, and that has been so drastically altered, and I think, really, if I've done anything, it's, it's try to explain that in a somewhat calm manner, 
on my show. Sometimes it's tough to do calmly and some four letter words do get in there. Uh, but that really is what I've tried to do and I think it's, it's caught on and uh, we just gotta keep pushing because I don't know if you know about this but there's a presidential election coming again. It never, it never seems to stop and, uh, and, it, and the crazy is always here. And I think if we can figure out ways to mitigate the crazy, uh, that, that really is how we will we'll get past all of this. I think it, I think the question I've got is gonna, <clears throat> excuse me, nicely follow on that, which is you lived in New York, you lived on the other coast, um, you got a few miles on you now. Um, what do you wake up thinking about? What do you, what do you, what gives you doubt? What do you worry about? You know, it's funny. I. I don't think I could do what I do, meaning talk about politics and these culture wars and all of the craziness, if I wasn't an optimist to some degree. You have to be, otherwise you just get up there every day and, and the news obviously is always nuts. There's always something to be angry about. The entire corporate press is designed to make us all completely insane. Uh, but I'm not a blind optimist. I, I would say I'm sort of a world-weary optimist. I, I believe that we can make the world better, usually on the margins, I, you know, sometimes things just kind of go and there's little ways that you and your life can make things a little bit better, whether that's in your family or your community or whatever it might be. Um, but what I'm worried about, I think, is probably what you're all worried about. You know, it does feel like that there that this experiment, and I love, I love describing America as an experiment. My, my friend Dennis Prager, who I'm sure you guys are all familiar with, uh, he always was describing America as an experiment. This idea that these people from all over the world could come here usually with nothing. I mean, if we were to, if I could poll the room, I, and I do this often when I go to colleges, and I'll say, you know, how many of you, your grandparents or great grandparents, or whether you're first generation or second generation, everyone in this room, our ancestors, whoever came here first, however many generations in deep you are, they came with nothing. They came with nothing, virtually everybody. And every single one of us have a better life right now. But that feels tenuous. And that's why I think there's something interesting going on on college campuses, because these kids are now growing up in a world where, if I talk to each and every one of you, I think most of us probably felt like the world was kind of settled. We, we felt like, okay, America is good, it's gonna continue, you know, the basic ideas of freedom are good, the Constitution is good, all of the, the institutions that we have, sure, we can change them a little bit here and there, and we can fight about tax rates and this and that and the other thing, but the, but the basic idea is gonna continue and be good. I don't think most people feel that anymore, uh, or that it will, well, I think most people think it's good, I think, I actually do believe we're the majority, but I think a huge amount of people now believe that it is shaking. The idea that this will continue, that Western democracy can work, that plurality of thought can work. So I worry about that constantly. It's funny, I don't worry about the little things. I'm not stressed about just the minutia of life, but I really am worried about our ability to continue to, to do this, to you know send kids to schools where they will actually come out as more functional people. Uh, as I'm sure some of you guys know, I, I toured with Jordan Peterson for a year and a half, who I think is without question the most influential public speaker of modern times. And Jordan, who was a clinical psychologist originally, uh, his main message in essence was, you know, stand up straight with your shoulders back. The, the line that people really caught on with him, he said, clean your room before you clean the world. And there's a complete flip of that happening right now where uh, actually a, a friend of mine, who I'm sure some of you are familiar with from the Daily Wire, Michael Knowles, is giving a talk tonight at Purdue University, and there's massive protests turning violent as we speak. Uh, and Michael, he, I suppose he has some controversial opinions. He, he might word things, and I, I happen to like him a lot. I, I agree with him on a lot. I disagree with him on a lot, and we've done it publicly many times. Uh, but this idea that you can't sit and listen to somebody and hear what they think and then compare and contrast that to what you think. Uh, that's, what, that's what Western democracy and, and actually true liberalism is based on, and it's, it's kinda hanging on. I mean, just, just by nods or applause. I mean, how many of you, for the first time in your life in the last few years, kinda feel like maybe it's, it's not gonna continue, right? Like, that, that it's just sort of, it's not, maybe that wasn't the thing to applaud exactly. I, I did that backwards. I guess you could bow your head or something. We could all groan. How about we groan together? Uh, <laughs> um, 
Right, that's the clip that someone will put up there. Dave Rubin says America's not going to continue. They applaud in Wisconsin. Okay. <laughs> but that's the thing. That, that doubt is what I would say. I, I, that doubt that, that the thing that is so precious uh, might not continue the way we all thought it would. And by the way, uh, that is a function of our success. It is the function of every great society's success that the good times that that success allows for creates you know, a breeding ground for bad ideas to come in. And, and we're at that real precipice right now. Which way are we gonna go? It's interesting because, you know, one of the most common things we run into every day is somebody says, how are you? I, I get it a lot. And I, I have a hard time answering the question um, because as you just said, my life is pretty good. You know, I'm glad to be 60. You know, life is pretty good. I mean, the only problem I have is the Joe Biden hairline. <laughs> <sighs> I thought, you know, you channeled, you know, a little bit of Trump. I thought I should channel yeah, a little yeah. bit of Biden. <laughs> That's what you get. Yeah, working my way right through it. But, um, y you know, I, I almost feel like I can't answer the question honestly by ignoring what's really on my heart and on my mind. And those are the kinds of things that, that trouble all of us, I think, and by you know, the acknowledgement to Dave's question, it's, it's very clear. There's a, most of us, I can see a couple of folks who may not know, uh, there's a doomsday clock, right? Many of us sort of grew up understanding the threat of communism and nuclear war, and you know, the, the second hand kind of sits up there real tight against the 12. And my question is, on that whole question of the American experiment, what time is it? <laughs> well, it's funny because I get that everywhere I go now. You know, usually people know me, so if I go to the supermarket, Dave, how you doing? You know, I go bowling, wherever it might be. So I get the how you doing a lot. And I always say something similar to that, actually. I say, well, I'm doing pretty well, but the country's in trouble. There's just no doubt about it. You know, it's interesting. One of the things that I've noticed from the last couple of years, especially, having lived in California where for, I moved to Cali in 2013, and for the first seven or so years, it was great. Yeah, it's high taxes. There was some level of a homeless problem, you know, just some of the nonsense of Hollywood and that kind of thing. But California is beautiful and the coast and wine country and all that. There's a reason people go there and that it was the dream of, of moving west to that you could live in California. Um, but having for the last 15 months lived in Florida, I, I see something that, that is really, really special. Uh, when, you, when you move to a place that is in line with your values, and I, and I hope for you guys that live here that, that this is the place for that, and it's gonna be your job to, to defend it and keep defending it, um, it allows not just, it's not just that the politics work, right? Because hopefully you believe in something else beyond politics, and hopefully your politicians are getting out of your way enough to live whatever life you wanna live. But what I have found in living in a really hyper, what I would say is a hyper-functional place, Florida, where crime is basically non-existent, except you've probably seen some of the videos, uh, spring break in Miami Beach can be uh, quite a situation, and they'll, they're dealing with that. Uh, but those are not Floridians, and it's a very controlled situation. And ironically, uh, the mayor of Miami Beach is one of the only Democrat mayors left in all of Florida. So you can, you can do the math on that. Um, but, you know, we basically, as a, as a state, we have virtually no unemployment. It's the lowest all-time unemployment. Our education system, and I'll, I'll talk about it in a bit, through all the things that DeSantis is doing, is getting all of the bad ideas out. Uh, we're building like crazy. You know, 1,200 people move to Florida every day, almost a million people since COVID. So there's this influx of people, and it's not just that they come and they set up shop and... It, there's, you know, you you don't connect with your neighbors. What I'm finding, and I'm one of the new guys, so I, I'll be walking around my neighborhood, and especially for the first few months, you know, I'd be walking my dog, and the neighbors would come up, and they'd say, oh, oh you're the new guy, you live over there, and they'd say, where are you from? And I'd go, Cali, and they'd freak out. You could see it. They, oh, shit, another one of them. <laughs> and I realized there was a theme happening here, so I, what I started doing, I kid you not, before I would walk out with the dog, I would put a picture of me and DeSantis on my phone so that I could just go, you got nothing to worry about, and I would go like this. 
and and it would be okay. But I I mention that because there's something else that happens when when you move to a place or live in a place that's more lined up with your values. People are genuinely happier. They are kinder. They are more generous of spirit and time and all of those things. And and I think that's what we can figure out how to return to. Uh, you know, the problem that we're having as a country. Th there's a lot of problems, obviously, but the problem we're having really. I would say the macro problem is that the federal government is so big right now. It is so it is so in all of our lives. Even if you guys here in Wisconsin do everything right, you elect all the right leaders, you you make sure that your police department is well funded, you get the drugs off the streets, you do everything. Well, the federal government can still crash the economy. They can still do crazy bank bailouts. They can still do all this stuff with inflation and all of these things. They can still, you know, toss all of our money to to a war halfway across the world that we're technically not even in but we're but we're endlessly putting money towards and and i think that disconnect between people's day-to-day -day lives which often are, are pretty good again if i polled you guys i'm gonna guess most of you probably have relatively decent lives you feel like you've probably done something okay on this planet and and hopefully that's true uh but the disconnect between that and what we're dealing with on a daily basis and it's not just the politics part, I mean the, the mainstream media part of it where they just, everything is a lie constantly and we're constantly up against this thing. Uh, I think figuring out how to, how to, let's say, pilfer some happiness and some purpose out of that, that's really, that's the trick. It's up, it's up for everybody, by the way. It's not just whether you live in Wisconsin or Florida or Cali, it's like everyone has to figure out what their role in this is because we all, even people that are completely on the opposite side of the spectrum politically as me, they, they sense something's wrong too. They just think the solutions are different. Um, and, and it's your job to figure out how you can manage within that. You mentioned the whole issue of optimism. And for those of you who were lucky enough to be around 22 years ago before Governor Thompson went to work for Governor Bush, um, now pre well, President Bush, there was a sense of optimism and almost an ebullient joy that the governor sort of carried everywhere he went. And, you know, having been there with him, I know it wasn't perfect. Um, you know, I, I mean, he almost got arrested for trying to strangle Lee Iacocca uh, as the, uh, the administration first began and they tried to pull out of uh, Kenosha. But it is that certain joy to understand that you can bring people together, you can work hard, you can find solutions, and those things are, are oftentimes lost, and we feel empty about it. And I think you're right, there's a, there's a point where we're gonna get back to that. Um, I get up every morning hoping that we will and trying to find a way to do that. And, uh, you know, I think most of you do as well, and that's gonna really truly be the challenge. There's a, you know, in America, we, we talk a lot about sort of the rugged individualism. And everybody likes the cowboy and pull yourself up by your bootstraps and, you know, do what you're supposed to do, uh, you know, eat your broccoli, um, all that sort of stuff. But we also are sort of in a position where we've been kind to our neighbors. We've been thoughtful. We know there's a social contract that we live under. And I'm curious, you know, I, I followed you for a long time, and I watched the folks that you listen to and do this with, and I know they're thoughtful folks. So I, I, how do we reconcile that individualism that many of us, we do feel okay about? You know, as individuals, we're okay, but that social, compact and what we owe or what's our obligation to each other and and how does how do we reconcile that well i would say at first uh it gets to what i started saying about jordan this idea of you know he says he says he says a couple things that are really spectacular you, you guys all know jordan peterson right i don't have to do a major a bio on jordan okay um he really i mean w watching what this man has done the amount of people i'll tell you something something great and then i will answer the question so i i toured with jordan in 2018 into 2019 about 120 stops in 20 countries in in little less than a year and a half it was unbelievable across the globe it was incredible and at the time most of the audience that we were talking to, they, they generally tended to be younger guys. So guys 
kind of late teens into their mid mid twenties, sometimes early thirties, and then obviously some fringes around that. Um, but it was a lot of guys that had they didn't have proper guidance that are there either a, they didn't have a good role model as a father or a good community or whatever it might be, and they were really just starving for someone to tell them you have some autonomy in your life. There is something you can do to fix the world, uh, to fix yourself first and then fix the world. That, that really is the line that he would always be saying. Uh, and then that, then you present yourself to the world and then maybe you can fix the world. We seem to be doing it backwards now. You know, all of these kids that are burning down college campuses and constantly screaming and all of the, the, the crazy stuff that we're seeing burst forth, it generally is from a bunch of people that are trying to fix the world before fixing themselves. If they dealt with whatever it is that they have to deal with at an existential level first, they probably wouldn't be so angry at the world. So they've, got, they've sort of got the whole thing uh, backwards. And having seen that, uh, now Jordan is still on tour, and I have obviously other things going on, so I, I couldn't tour with him this time, but when he's been in Florida, I just do these little one-offs with him. And about three weeks ago, I, I uh, did the show with him in Fort Lauderdale. It was a massive stadium, about 10,000 people. And we noticed something really interesting, that his audience has actually grown with him. So the, the kids, in essence, that were you know late teens, early 20s, most of them single, really trying to get their stuff together. Now, they were a little bit older. They were dressing up a little bit nicer. A lot of them had girlfriends or partners. They were, they were, they were there. They had done the work to do better. And I think that, that gets to your question about rugged individuality and where that plays in the world. Um, you know, these kids on college campus now, it's funny, I, I'm 46, I keep saying kids on college campus. Am I that old? It's 46, I don't know where that, where that in, in the whole thing. It's weird, you know, our whole sense of age, I also think... It doesn't get better. It, do, it, doesn't, it doesn't get it better. Does not, it does not get better. I know. I have like one pain in my body now that just kind of moves around and I guess then it becomes two pains and then, yeah. Um, and then, <laughs> listen, you're doing way better than Joe Biden, I'll tell you that much. You well, nothing, this is my hair. You this is nothing, my hair. Yeah. It all belongs to me. It didn't come from some other part of my body. So I'm you yeah. know, doing okay. <laughs> They have done so many strange things to Joe Biden, just as a side. I mean, if this, you know, I don't believe in the patriarchy as a, the way that it's normally framed in the media, but if any, if he was a woman, the amount of criticism he would be getting for the crazy things they've done to his face and his eyes and the hair, it's just, anyway, sidebar. Um, that's on top of all the mental issues that we all know about. I mean, the fact that this guy's president of the United States, that, well, that actually is part of the problem. Right, the fact that, that we all know something's wrong with the president of the United States, putting aside the ideas and the policies, we all know something's physically or me and or mentally wrong with him, but we pretend that it's not. And that is a real problem. I mean, is this the guy that you want leading us in, in the from an American perspective internally and, and externally through the world? But in any event, in terms of individualism and how that plays into the rest of society, I mean, having now moved to Florida, and I, I live in the suburbs of Miami, and moving into a community where I see it works, and I go out of my way to the first thing that I did, actually, when we got there, uh, was I got into, I'm in a little town outside of Miami, the first thing I did was find the mayor, who I had never heard of, it's not the mayor of Miami proper, and it's not the mayor of Miami Beach, who I mentioned earlier, and I said, can I meet you for coffee? I just wanna know a little bit about the community. And we went out for coffee, and he told me some of the things he's trying to do in the community, and now I'm trying to help him do a few projects. Uh, meet your local law enforcement. If you just start knowing, I suspect you guys are probably pretty good at it here, um, but I think it's one of the things that we don't, we don't do well enough. You know, we, it's funny, the pilgrims and the, and the original Americans, every, everyone came here uh, because we were trying to escape a king, right? We were trying to escape the idea of a, of a top-down system where basically one guy up top was gonna tell everybody how to live. And yet, oddly, in modern times, we're, we're recreating that constantly. You know, the, the president should have very little to do with your life. The president should be making sure the borders are secure. He's obviously not doing that. He should be making sure that the, you know, the states aren't warring with each other. Um, but he doesn't have that, you know, and he can set some level of monetary policy, but he really shouldn't have that much to do with anything else. We've created a system now that is completely wrong. And that what that does over time is it degrades the ability to be an individual. And, and I think one of the other movements that's gonna really start 
kicking in is that I think a lot of people, and it's, I think it's happening already, actually, a lot of people are just going to kind of check out of the system altogether. And I think that's part of why the media, or it's one of the reasons that the media has been so negligent, what they have done, what CNN and the New York Times and Washington Post and all of them, by lying to us over and over and over and becoming partisan activists instead of uh, you know honest arbiters of truth or even something close to that, uh, they've caused a situation where, where a lot of people are just like, I can't think about this stuff anymore. I can't deal with it anymore. I'm just going to check out, live my life. That's it. I'm not going to vote. I'm not going to get involved. I'm just going to have what I have, and that'll be it. And, you know, that can work for you at a micro level for a certain amount of time. Um, but as a society, it can't work long term. So it's a constant struggle between individualism, what do I want to do in my life, and what the connection points are that you can take into the into the world to make sure you can actually go ahead and do that. You mentioned, you know, the lies. And it's a strong word. I mean, people in public life, well, maybe not as much as we used to, not say that out loud to people on a stage with us. Um, but, but it's a strong word. And it, 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 it connotes a foundation of untrustfulness. And I'm just curious. Uh, I, I, I'm not crazy, too crazy, a little bit crazy. And, you know, in my quieter moments, or sometimes at 4 o'clock in the morning, I'll be looking through my phone and things come up and they get my attention and I start going down the rabbit hole. And by that time, you know, somebody else has woke up and I can say, oh my God, you wouldn't believe what I just figured out. Thankfully, you know, I get pulled back a little bit and reality sets in and, but who can, who do you, who do we believe? Who, who tells the truth? And, you know, and it's a, it's a two part question. Either I really, was really prepared or this is a lot easier than I thought. Um, who, who can we believe? And how do we avoid the hypocrisy of that truthfulness? Because you can be, you can tell the truth and still do the wrong thing. So. Well, it's funny because one of the things that people say to me all the time is they go, Dave, I, I trust you. You're, you're the guy I trust. And over time, the more I started hearing that, it, it, it's obviously a compliment, but I kept hearing it over and over and I started thinking, man, we are in a lot of trouble. We really are. I, I am trying to tell the truth. I, I'm trying my best. Uh, I know I've got a couple. I met a, a whole bunch of you beforehand. I know I have a couple of you know, real hardcore viewers of the show, and you guys know every day I get up there, I try to communicate this stuff as much as clearly as possibly and honestly as possible. And, and one of the things that I don't do is I don't hide my biases. I think part of the problem that we have right now is if you turn on CNN or MSNBC or whatever it is, they're pretending that they're journalists, right? But we know that they're not. We know that they're activists. You know, Anderson Cooper or Jake Tapper or any of these guys, they're pretending they have no feelings about any of these things. But they do have feelings about these things. And generally speaking, almost without exception on the main networks, their feelings happen to be more in line with the Democrat Party. So they end up running cover, really, for the Democrat Party. And then, and then that, you watch that long enough, and it doesn't match up with your reality. You feel like you're being fed nonsense. And I, I really have come to this belief over the last couple of years uh, that there is something so fundamentally, I would say, uh, connective about the truth, the, 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 the real truth, not your truth, the truth, that you know over time when people are lying to you long enough. And I think actually, although I've been a little frustrated with President Trump the last couple of days, um, I think that was his greatest asset. He somehow was willing, and maybe it was because, you know, he was a New York City builder. That is a freaking tough job, New York City real estate. And he was around all these people forever. He was donating, you know, he donated to Hillary and he donated to Republicans. He was always in the mix with all of these people. He saw how the sausage was made. He saw the lies. And then something about him said, enough is enough. I'm going to expose it. Now, it's, I'm not telling you that he is he is the great truth teller or that he doesn't lie either. Uh, but I think this issue that it's getting increasingly hard for any of us to find 
find someone that you can trust. And then the thing is, we're all finding different people we can trust, right? So again, if I did a poll around this room, I could probably find, you know, 10 or 15 different people that you'd be like, that's the one telling me the truth. And then I could contrast that with what someone else would say. And they'd, no, no, that, that, that guy's a liar. And, and that really is becoming a problem because, you know, again, at 46 years old, I'm not, I'm not that old. I'm right in the middle of Gen, Gen X. And I grew up, we had ABC News, we had CBS News and NBC News at 6.30, nightly news. And whether you like Tom Brokaw or Peter Jennings or, uh, what was his name, uh, Dan Rather, that was basically what you chose why you were watching it, because they pretty much covered the same thing, right? And then, you know, cable news kicks in, 24-hour news kicked in, really early 80s, around 81 or so for CNN. And then suddenly news was on all the time. They have to fill all this time. They're talking all the time. They're pretending that they're giving you facts when they're giving you opinions. And it's becoming increasingly hard to figure out what's true. What, what's interesting about that also is that, you know, if you go back to, to nightly news of, you know, just say 1987, and they're all basically covering the same things, right? Maybe in a slightly different order. And, and truly, you were basically just watching uh, whoever you happen to like more if you just liked one of their affects more you'd, you'd watch you'd watch them a little bit more but we had a certain set as a nation we could all agree okay these are roughly the issues that matter these are roughly the this is roughly the reality that we live in now our reality scans from you know something like alex jones to rachel maddow that is a pre pretty freaking wide chasm and you wonder why so many people are on drugs i mean that that really that really is it. That re and, you know, there's another dangerous part of it because then what happens, and I'm sure many of you went through this too, those of us, and I definitely include myself in this, who were called conspiracy theories for, uh, theorists for years because we didn't immediately swallow the company line on COVID or on whatever it might be, you know, what's happening in Ukraine now or whatever. You know, we, we, it turns out that the truth is a time-release pill. It's like, oh, well, you get the truth, but it's going to be about three years later. That seems to be what we're in right now. So it is an extremely difficult situation, and I don't know how we rectify that. I, I really don't. I, I don't think there should be one sort of centralized network that is supposedly telling us the truth, right? I mean, that literally, it's basically the plot of 1984, so we don't want that. And yet we are in this very sort of strange spot right now, and this is also a result of, you know, we're 20 plus years into social media now. We all walk around with the phone. If I could give you a personal piece of advice, you should not be looking at your phone at 4 a.m. I mean, <laughs> nothing good is happening. There is literally no chance you're going to open your phone up at 4 a.m. and be like, oh, wow, that's great. Like, no, never. It will only be bad. Um, I, that's an actual, one of the things that I really try to do, and I, I really believe it's one of the things that's kept me honest and, and uh, I would say roughly sane during politics, uh, throughout politics, is don't keep your phone in your room and certainly don't keep at night and certainly don't keep it on your nightstand. It's the last thing we look at. It's the first thing we wake up to. You wake up at 4 a.m. looking at this thing. And guess what? The world is going to continue either way. Either way, it's going to continue. And you, your last moments before you close your eyes to go to bed should not be doom scrolling Twitter. You remember the internet when it first started? Remember web pages used to get to an end? Remember there would be an end. So if you went to CNN.com, they had 20 articles and you know a couple things on the side, and then you'd scroll, and then it would get to the end. We don't have, there's no end anymore, right? We have infinite scroll. The, the guy who invented infinite scroll, by the way, uh, I can't remember his name, he completely regrets it. He thinks he unleashed something truly evil in society because we sit there all day long, all day long. The old days, you were meeting a friend at a bar, if you, or uh, you know, wherever. Uh, you'd stand on the corner maybe till they got there. The old days, you'd have to look around. Look, oh my God, there's people walking around. There's a bird, there's somebody walking their dog. What do you do now? You just stare at this thing and you endlessly do it and we all do it and it's rewiring us and it's happening in real time and we're all in it. We're all in it together and we don't know how to stop. So, so I would say get your phone out of your room. 4 a.m., you will never wake up to good news at 4 a.m. You're right, it's rarely good news. <laughs> um, it's somehow comforting though. I don't know, you know, something to live for when I actually get out of bed. Um, <laughs> well, we just went very dark here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, tell me more about that. I'm happy to do it. Yeah. <laughs> not, uh, not surprisingly, I've been here before. Um, no, the it, it is a it is a huge 
chasm to get across to understand, I mean, nobody wants to waste their time. Nobody wants to read, hear, listen to stuff that isn't accurate or truthful or you're being played. And how you do that is really tough, but I, I'll, I'll submit to you, it, Governor Thompson, um, you know, he had contacts and relationships across the spectrum. I got news for you. He didn't always believe all of his Republican colleagues all the time. He had Democrat friends. And as somebody who was paid to give him good advice, he didn't always believe me, which was very clear. and was a great lesson. But having those contacts, having those relationships across the aisle with people that are different than you, it almost assures the truth. Because, it, you know, I spent a lot of time in the criminal justice system, and one of the things I learned about watching courts operate is there's the defense and there's the prosecution. Generally, the truth is somewhere in the middle. And that's what we got a judge for or a jury for. Simple question. Who's your Democrat, liberal, commie, pinko, simp friend? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. It's getting increasingly difficult. Um, so I'm going to go out on a limb here and guess that most of you guys probably lean somewhat conservative or that, let's just say, somewhat right-leaning. It's getting really hard. You know, one of the things, I'm going to DC next week for three days and we, we got a studio there and we sent out emails to everybody, everybody you could think of. Um, and we only, and I'm gonna just do as many interviews as we can. I think we have about two dozen interviews lined up. We're gonna take a whole bunch of Congress people and senators and just sit them down together. We don't even know if some of them have, have worked together or met. We're just packing in as many things as, as humanly possible. Uh, we reached out to Democrats, we reached out to Republicans. Uh, every single Republican that we reached out to said yes, uh, except one, you'll find this interesting, Mitch McConnell was the only one who said, he's the only one that, who said no. Now he may have some conflict or something. Now we know they're in session, so we know that basically everybody's there. Uh, we do have Ron Johnson, by the way, he immediately said yes, and I'm, by the way, let, let me just quickly, I, I will answer a question, but quickly on Ron Johnson, I, I am so absolutely impressed with him, absolutely impressed. I was at an event, uh, Governor DeSantis, as you may know, it's, it's partly uh, what his new book is about, uh, is doing these events, these Blueprint for America events that basically we wanna take what's happening in Florida, the success of Florida, and we wanna blueprint that across the states. And he's been doing these events throughout, mostly in Florida, to do this where he brings in other senators and Congress people and governors uh, and I was at a private event, about 20 of us with Congress people and senators, and, and Senator Johnson was there. It was the first time I met him. This is about two or three weeks ago. He is so clear. He is so on the ball. Uh, you guys have picked the right guy to fight these fights, and I think he, I mean, this guy hates Fauci. I mean, he, he hates him with a passion. I can't even repeat to you good people some of the things he was saying to me. Uh, so Fauci's in a lot of trouble if Ron Johnson gets his uh, gets his choice. I, I'm sorry, what was the question? I went on a total uh, sidebar no, there. It, 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 oh, well, sorry, the, yeah. the other side. How do you find the ones? So, okay, so we, we put out all these invites, uh, and we'll have about 30 Republicans. Uh, Mitch McConnell, only one who said no on the Republican side. We got zero from the Democrats. That wasn't a white power sign. That was just regular zero <laughs> that I did there. Um, we got zero from the Democrats. And what was interesting about that is, you know, I'm not known as a, as a hardball interviewer. Actually, most of my, the criticism I get on my interview style is that I'm, I'm more of a softball interviewer. I like hearing what people think. I like letting them talk. I don't berate them, whatever. So I would have, and I, I made a point of saying this on the show, I would have, and I really do mean it, I would have treated every single Democrat the exact same way I would have treated the Republicans. Because I have frustrations with the Republicans, too. Um, and that would have been the moment that would have mattered, right? If I, um, if I could have sat down with AOC for as, between us how ridiculous I think she is and, and just, she's a socialist and she's not even, a, she's LARPing as a socialist. I mean, she's acting as a socialist. She doesn't know what she is. LARPing is, you know LARPing? LARPing is live action role play and this is what, when you see these, it happens on college campuses a lot, these kids that dress up, they think they're in Game of Thrones and they live their life like that and it's like, 
lady, you don't own a dragon, <laughs> settle down. Um, but that's what AOC is doing. I don't think she believes any of this nonsense. She doesn't know what she believes. She's, she's pretending to be this, you know, righteous indignation socialist, you know, screaming at America, shaking her fist at the rest of us. Um, but we could not get any responses on that. And, um, you know, I wonder, are, are the Democrats in Wisconsin maybe a little bit more moderate than what the, the no? No? So that's interesting. Maybe some, I, I would guess if we really willed it down, it's probably a little bit better here. Uh, but in terms of what we're getting on, on the federal side, I mean, they're out of control. Who, who is saying anything roughly true? One of the things I say on the show all the time is, if you just took a uh, jean Corinne Prière, she's the, the White House press secretary, she's horrible. I mean, she's, she's absolutely horrible. I thought Jen Psaki was horrible, but this woman, Psaki's feeling great these days. She's going, man, <laughs> I was pretty good. What, what's that? I am saying she lies. I am saying, and I say this on the show often, if you just took everything they say and reversed it, just put not at the beginning of the sentence, everything would be far closer to the truth. That, that, that is how far gone these people have gone. And what's, what's upsetting about that is I found, and I think some of you know this, and I'll, I'll talk about this more in a bit, but you know, I was a lefty most of my life. I, I was a liberal. I grew up in New York, um, and, and there were reasons to be an old school liberal. I suspect some of you probably were old school liberals. JFK was a liberal. Ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. There were sane Democrats. There were blue dog Democrats. They were right here in Wisconsin. Um, but they're gone. It has been completely obliterated. And they basically are a collection of sort of quasi-socialist and, and a bunch of people who are just afraid of the quasi-socialists. So I suspect if you got a couple Democrats, you know, more moderate Democrats in a room, you could get them to admit a bunch of, you know, decent policy positions. But they are basically letting their inmates run the asylum at this point. And you have to give the progressives credit. I mean, you can't just always look at them and be like, ah, they're all nuts, they're socialists, they're woke, they're lunatics. It's like, well, all right, if they are, what does it say about us? Because they've taken an awful lot from this country, right? They've, they've wrought an awful lot of destruction. So it's getting increasingly difficult to do. I wish we could do it more. I, I, you know, Back in the day, I used to be uh, challenged for debates all the time, and I would do them. Those calls don't come anymore. It's, it's, sort of, it's become very hysterical and, and, uh, and, I would say, monolithic in its thinking. And if you don't think, it's not just that if you don't think like them. If you don't think like them the moment they think it, right? They don't give you any movement on that. The second they tell you, all right, you know, if you feel like a girl and you were born a boy, you're a girl. If you don't jump on that bandwagon the second that they want you to, now you're a transphobe, and now you're a racist, and you're a bigot, and all of the stuff. And how we, how we arbitrage those two situations, it, it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. Well, in that Especially when you factor in the, the media compo component and the social media part that we talked about earlier. Well, and it, it, LARPing? LARPing? LARPing. LARPing. Yeah, yeah it, so much of it does seem to be performance art. I mean, it's like everything is a performance. And, uh, you know, we see the former state treasurer, the former state representative, uh, revenue secretary, right? Kate Zeisky. Um, what happens here is different than what happens there. You know, you and I might have a disagreement publicly, but we might be able to talk about that disagreement and find a way to bridge a gap, solve a problem, come to some accommodation. I'm not sure that people actually understand the difference between a debate, performance, and a discussion about thinking. Very, very troubling. Very, very troubling. Um, none of you came here to hear me. So um, I, I know you've got questions, and we'd like to be able to uh, have you ask them of Dave. I tell you. I can just feel the steam coming off him. I mean, he's just, it's amazing. We also have Senator Wimberger with us here tonight, and uh, I tell you, he's a great addition to the legislature and uh, is doing a bang-up job um, out there. Yeah, it's a, quite something. Uh, with my Joe Biden haircut, I can't see so good. Oh, you got it right up there. Don't be shy, guys, and I'm happy to take any, anyone who wants to jump to the front that disagrees with me. I'm, I'm more than happy to do that as well. 
it, it, I'm age 60 also and watching politics over 40 years. I, I think I'd, I'd posit that we have a candidate quality issue that I think is fundamentally affecting everything. We, to your point, the, the, the rich, smart people have checked out with their money and you know, we've got you know, many of the liberal virtue signaling people really have, are unaffected by all of the inflation and things that actually harm the Democrats and, and Republicans as well. And so you've got the smart people checking out with their money and we've got you know, politics as theater for many and then we've got in its place poor quality candidates who are actually doing the, the damage. And I'm wondering whether you think that thesis holds up. Yeah, you know, politics is, is really, really messy. Um, you know, people ask me all the time, especially when I was in Cali, you know, I was campaigning with Larry Elder to, for the recall to get rid of Gavin Newsom. And I opened for Larry at some events and I had a lot of influential people in California asking me to either run for governor or do something. And I don't think that I personally could do all of the evil stuff that it would take or be part of or control or direct all of that stuff to do it. And I think a lot of good people feel that. I'm sure someone in this room has thought about running and, and then just said, you know what, I, I can't do it. I don't want to be dragged this way. I don't want them to lie about me and my family and all of those other things. So we, we end up, so you get this selection of candidates that usually is not the best of the best. But I'll give you the, the white pill or the, the nice version of that, which is that we do have a couple really good people right now. We do. I, I, as I said, I, I told you what I think about Ron Johnson, but I can do the very easy version of this is the DeSantis version. It is not going to get better than this guy. It, it really is not. I, I have gotten to know him quite well. I've done a bunch of events with him. We've broken bread many times. What he is doing in Florida is what I think most, almost all Americans really want, a certain set of people don't know that they want it. But basically a government that is slim and trim isn't gonna tax you into oblivion, is gonna make sure, you know, the, the left and the media is always going after him about all this education stuff. It's like, we're teaching financial literacy now in Florida. That was not taught, and it is not taught in most uh, schools, state schools throughout the country. Uh, they're getting rid of a lot of the things, some of the things that we've talked about here, some of this woke nonsense and gender stuff. I mean, think about it. You know, you've got teachers talking to third graders about sexuality and gender and a whole bunch of crazy stuff. Everyone in this room, for one moment, picture your third grade teacher. Try to remember the name of your third grade teacher, okay? Now try to rem think of that person talking to you about sex. It's Whoa. so, yeah. <laughs> It is so... Mrs. Pliss. Mrs. Oh Pliss, God. yeah. My third grade teacher was this woman, Mrs. Kochenauer. I, I adored this woman. She, taught, she read us um, uh, The Secret Garden, and she, she acted it out. She did all the characters. Yeah, I absolutely love... That would even be more interesting. That, <laughs> <laughs> um, I love this woman, and I remember thinking she was, she was like 150. She was probably 50 years old or something. But the idea that these... You know, they're state employees that they've decided that they can talk to your children about these things that have nothing to do with education, nothing to do with putting them in the world, to, to be able to effectively live as human beings in, in a prosperous way. Um, we're really doing it right there. And we have good, it's not just him, you know, he's the face of it. One of the things that I, I, I like a lot of things about DeSantis, obviously, but one of the things that I, I like about his communication style, which is in huge contrast to most politicians, if you notice, he, when he's giving speeches, he almost always says we meaning that he has got an incredible staff around him. He has, he has people around him, campaign managers, et cetera, et cetera, that are doing this. And that if he does decide to run, I'm fully confident that Florida will continue to be free. We've, we've done, we have done the work to do it right uh, and to continue what is becoming a legacy of freedom. I mean, we went from a, from a state that was blue 20 years ago to purple to now re really the reddest state in the nation, basically. Um, so I don't, I don't know what we do to escalate that or to sort of replicate that across, uh, across the country, but I think it can start to happen. I, here's also where I would give Trump a, a good amount of credit. Trump, who obviously did not live, you know, the cleanest life, and I mean, look what he's in trouble for right now. I mean, how many of you have paid off a porn star for prostitution? Raise a hand. <laughs> oh, one guy, one guy. <laughs> <laughs> He actually did this. 
Um, <laughs> Honesty is good. Honesty, it feels good. Now it's your, every, everyone's doing a little bit of a, a little psychological treatment here tonight. That's nice. Um, but, but by him very obviously being a flawed human being, without question, not denying it the way everyone else denies it, I think he did open up some room for, you know, decent people. We're all flawed. We've all done things we're not proud of. We all went to college. You know what I mean? Like everybody's... You know, so so I think there is a little bit more room for that. I also think that we, we, as crazy as things are, we're getting on the other side of cancel culture to some extent. You know, there was that two-year phase where every day you'd wake up and it was like, okay, Matt Lauer is fired from the Today Show. This person's off that TV show. Roseanne's canceled. We're going to cancel the episode of the Golden Girls where Betty White had, you know, br brown uh, face paint on. Like, all, all of this endless stupidity. We do seem like we're sort of on the other side of that. So hopefully that'll encourage people to get involved. Uh, but I would also say that really the most important thing you can do, uh, and it sounds like we have a state senator here, is do it at the state level first. You know, everyone thinks I'm going to be president out of nowhere, I'm going to be senator out of nowhere, and go to Washington first. But you know, do it do it locally first, build it up for a little bit, and then and then see what happens. Yeah. I'll try to be a little more brief in the comments so that we can get to more. Dave, uh, first of all, thank you for coming to Green Bay um, and Wisconsin. We used to be Florida. Um, of the country uh, until other things happen. So um, I guess the, the question that I have for you, you talked about one specific can potential candidate for president uh, pretty significantly tonight. What would, in, in a perfect scenario, what should conservatives look for in a candidate that can not only get through the primary but get through the general election? What are, a, a, without mentioning names, what are the characteristics? Without mentioning names, okay. Um... I would say, well, I'll tell you what I'm looking for right now, and then you can probably apply this to, to all of the candidates, see if, you, if it matches up with the people that we know are running. What I want more than anything else right now is competency. That's it. That really is it. I don't care if you've done some things back in the day that you're not proud of. I, I actually don't. Um, I don't care if you're, a, you're braggadocious and over the top. What I want to know is, are you competent? Are you able to hire the right people? Are you able to com communicate the message of what is right about America and, and take it so that more kids on college campuses will be proud of this country and understand we are still, as wacky as things are, we are still literally the freest nation in the world, without question. Nobody leaves America, right? So you know, you get Bernie and AOC and all these people America's horrible, 1619 project, we were founded on racism, and all of this crazy nonsense. But nobody leaves, and everyone still wants to come to America, right? What's going on at our borders? It's only going one way, right? No, we don't, we're not trapping AOC here. Trust me, I, I would pay for the ticket. Um, <laughs> it only goes one way. So what, but what I want, I want competency and the ability to communicate what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, I, I know you asked me not to mention names, but one of my frustrations over the last couple of days with Trump is that, you know, this thing happened, this DA thing, which without question is an absolute abuse of power. It's nonsense. He's not going to be arrested, by the way. I mean, it, it, was a, it was a show. I think there were some fundraising reasons for it, but it's an abuse of power by a radical progressive DA who should be fired without question. The guy should be fired anyway because he was not doing his job as DA. Put aside Trump, the guy was taking felons that were, that were literally, you know, like beating up old women on the street to steal pocketbooks, and he was letting them out of jail immediately. Like, they stopped prosecuting basic crimes in New York City, and, I, and New York City, which I, I grew up in and loved, I mean, it, it, it's so depressing what has happened uh, to New York. Uh, but one of the things that I've been a, sort of annoyed with Trump over the last couple of days is, and, and I voted for him, I like him, I've interviewed him, I'm friends with his kids, so I, I you know, I'm, I'm choosing my words carefully here. It's like, the last couple of days, he gets this thing from the DA, and all of his fire went to DeSantis. And it was like, you know what? If that's the game that we're going to endlessly play, then we will all be dragged to hell together because good people will appear. Every now and again, you're going to get a good human being to appear and say, I'll do it. It doesn't really make sense. You know, DeSantis has three young kids. He knows what his family is about to be dragged through if this thing happens, if he, if he chooses to do it. And if Trump's main goal is to destroy the best guy that we have, I'm just not interested in that. I'm just not. And, and that could really suck for me professionally if he ends up winning, right? It could close a lot of doors for me. 
I think you have to you have to do what's right at times. But so to, just to clearly answer your question, competency and the ability to communicate it, that really is it. I mean, that's the difference, right? Biden. Does anyone in this room think Biden is competent? Do you think he has a handle on the issues? Do you think? I mean, you know, the other thing funny and then I'll stop, is when, when Biden tweets, and it's obviously not him tweeting, they try to write it as if it's him, you know, <laughs> folks, I this, blah, 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 corn pop that, and, you know, and it's like, man, we know they don't even let you hold a phone, and, and that's an issue, that is a real issue. The President of the United States is not allowed to hold a phone. That's a problem, and, and I think competency and, and communication really are the, are the two main traits at the moment. Can you um, give us your opinion of DEI? So DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, which they should call D-I-E because that's really what they would prefer us to do. Uh, did some, you got that? All right, one guy got it. Die, you got it? Okay, thank you. I always, if one guy gets it, I feel like I'm accomplished. Um, Diversity, equity, inclusion, base, I mean, it's socialism repackaged. It, it's equity over equality. How many of you saw the, uh, the, it was incredible. It was absolutely incredible. About three weeks ago, Bernie Sanders was, was on Real Time with Bill Maher. This was one of the most, this moment should have basically destroyed the entire socialist experiment happening in America. Bill Maher, who Bill, as I'm sure most of you agree with, Okay, he's a liberal for sure, he gets a lot of things wrong, but he's usually right on free speech. He doesn't like the wokesters, he ends up voting the wrong way. I'm, I've been working on him privately, like I'm trying, I'm trying to drag the guy there. I talk about him on my show all the time because I want to show him the light and I think it would really help. You know, His viewers are the type of sort of disaffected liberals that I think eventually could move. There's not a lot of constituencies in the country that actually, that really could potentially vote a different way. But, there, what's that? It's best to get him when he's smoking. I don't know if any of you saw, I did his podcast, two hours of, of drinking tequila, and then he got me smoking weed. It was, it was really something. <laughs> I don't recommend doing that with Bill Maher, by the way. Um, but there was an incredible moment on the show because he, he says to Bernie, he says, can you explain the difference between equity and equality? This is what the socialist experiment is, equity and equality. Equality, meaning equality of opportunity, that we have equal laws for everybody, and then, you know, it's up to you, and hard work, and hopefully a good family, and some people are born with more, some people are born less, and that is the gestalt of life, and, and you go out and get yours, and maybe it works, and maybe it doesn't. That is the American dream. Versus equity, which is that we will all end up in the same place, which is, this is the failed experiment of socialism and communism. It's why you have to kill an awful lot of people to get everyone in the exact same place because human beings are different, right? That's why communist regimes kill people. Um, by the way, Kam uh, Kamala Harris, the day before the presidential election, she put up a cartoon on her Twitter that I'm sure many of you saw where she called for equity. She said, because in essence, the reason I'm running and the reason that we're doing this is because we want everyone to end up in the same place. And what they mean by that is they're going to cut down a lot of you people. That's what they mean. And by you people, I mean us. They will, t they will gladly take from some and give to, the, uh, give to others and rejigger society in their vision of it. So DEI, DEI is in essence just the, the fancy words that sound good, right? Diversity sounds good. Equity, it, it, without thinking about it, it sounds good. Uh, to the Bernie point, Bernie did not know the difference. Bill Maher literally said, what is the difference between equity and equality? For Bernie, it would be like saying, what's the difference between socialism and capitalism? He, he fumbled, he started looking down, he said, I don't know. And then, and then Bill explained it to him, and then he came out on the side of equality. But his entire, it meaning that he came out on the side of equal opportunity. But his entire life's work has been for equity. And, and that's why when I tell you that uh, AOC is LARPing, they don't believe this nonsense. Trust me, AOC wants to be rich and she wants to wear fancy dresses and she wants her servants in masks while she goes to the Met. That's what she wants. And she's using the system against itself. And DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Inclusion, again, it sounds right. But as I often say on the show, I mean, the, the progressives are really good at messaging, but then you just peel a very thin veneer and you're gonna find something very nasty underneath. Are you telling me something? Oop. No, it, it, just to, to follow up on the whole issue of inclusion. 
there are some things I don't want to belong to. <laughs> and there are some people I don't want around me. And I got a sneak and hunch, some people maybe even in this room think the same thing. Uh, you know, fair enough. Uh, why do we want to impose what ought to be something that comes from the heart, which is a hospitality, an inclusion, you know, a thoughtfulness, to basically, I mean, include everybody. I don't want to include everybody. I mean, we could, do, we could do five hours on that. I would say the real answer to that is, is a spiritual crisis more than a political crisis, right? It's, it has nothing to do with politics. It's that politics has become religion to people. Uh, so it gets back to what I started with about these people that want to fix the world before they fix themselves. You will do a lot of nasty things on the way to creating a world that is in your image. Uh, you know, and and I, we should probably leave it there because otherwise we could do m many, many, many hours on that. No, yep, um, I think it was three or four weeks ago that John Stossel put out a very good video on uh, DEI. Have you done any shows or events with him? Or have you watched his video? It was an extremely good video on YouTube, and I'm sure it's on some other venues too, about DEI. And he interviewed a black college professor who was in charge of DEI at his university, and he changed and quit his job and works now for some other university. Yeah, I don't know that I saw the full thing, but I did see the preview of it on Twitter. John Stossel, I'm sure most of you know John Stossel. You know, he was on ABC in 2020 for many years, debunking nonsense. He really is, I would say, the uh, for the last maybe 40 years, he was probably the most outspoken mainstream libertarian thinker that we've had. Uh, and now he does his own thing with, I think he's mostly with reason these days. Um, so I didn't see the full thing. Um, but, you know, look, the simple truth is that while diversity in and of itself doesn't mean anything, just, okay, we've got this many black people and this many white people and this many gay people, it's just meaningless drivel, uh, there is value in having some of the minority voices speak out against these things. Thomas Sowell, for example, who's now, God bless him, I think he's 90, we're trying to work one more interview with him. We've been trying for quite some time. I'm really hoping we can do it. Uh, the first interview that I did with him w went unbelievably viral. And, you know, he's one of the great thinkers, the great economists and thinkers in America for the last five decades, really. He was a Marxist when he grew up and then started working for the government. And without giving you his whole life story, basically he started looking into why are black communities, uh, why do black communities tend to be more impoverished? And what he found using actual data and science and going to the communities, what he found was it had more to do with government programs keeping people in cycles of poverty than it had to do with anything else. He brought that to the department, uh, I think to the Treasury Department, and they basically said to him, okay, we're gonna shelve that, that's not the business we're in, meaning they're in the business of growing government, they're in the business of getting more money for, to employ more people, the state just continues. And all of that being said, the fact that he happens to be black and can communicate this stuff is good. I think it's partly why Candace Owens has taken off the way she has, and many other people. It's, it's, you know, it's an unfortunate reality in a certain way, because I'm gonna guess that you guys don't really care about the skin color of people, and I certainly don't. And I don't think most people care about people's gender or even sexuality. But every now and again, when you get a voice from those minorities, that is really outspoken. I think it can be particularly effective. So we were talking about the... Oh, I'm sorry. I'll do it quick, I'll do it quick. Go ahead. Uh, okay, go ahead. Oh. I was just gonna ask, out of all the crazy issues in the world, and you're so knowledgeable, what do you feel is the most concerning issue? I mean, it's sort of what we've seem to have centered this around. The, the woke thing really is the most concerning issue. It has upended everything. It has upended absolutely everything in America to the point that we literally are teaching boys that they're girls, that girls that, that, girls that they're boys. We're teaching race essentialism in public schools, that kids should be judged on the color of their skin. I mean, it's quite literally the reverse of what Martin Luther King wanted. Um, that concept, and, and you have to, again, you have to give it credit. You can't, you can't just dismiss it like, ah, oh, look at those crazy wokesters. Um, you know, in, in Don't Burn This Country, one of the ways I tried to communicate it was, uh, if you guys remember the original, I'm sure everyone in here has seen it, the original, I think, 1977 Aliens with Sigourney Weaver, 
there's an incredible moment, uh, it, the movie's spectacular, but there's an incredible moment about halfway through, maybe a little more towards the end, where you know the alien has ripped through the ship and it has killed virtually everybody. There's maybe three crewmen left in Sigourney, and you find out that the doctor on the ship turns out to be a, a robot. He's a humanoid, and he's actually, he likes the alien, even though it's killed everybody, and she can't understand it. Why, why do you like this thing? And the reason that he likes it, as he explains, is that he re he appreciates its perfection. It's doing exactly what it wants to do. It doesn't matter whether he likes what it's doing or not. The 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 remorselessness that it has and how it's effectively doing all of whatever its goals are. It wants to kill people, it wants to destroy this ship. It's doing all of that. And I sort of think that's the way we have to think of what's happening with the woke. You have to acknowledge they are doing this. They are it, none of us could have imagined 10 years ago that we would be in this spot that we are in right now. So you have to acknowledge it and see it and then we have to figure out how to get it out of our institutions. And again, I would say I would say DeSantis is leading on that. Uh, my guess is that that Ron Johnson's doing a pretty good job of it here. Um, but the senator has only limited amount of control of the state itself. Um, you know, obviously he's dealing more with federal issues, uh, but you need to elect the right leaders to get it, get it out of the schools. There's a reason they're going after your kids. And you know, when they can get your sixth grader to not even understand what gender they are, you think they might be ripe in five more years to have a whole set of ideas that will be beyond imagining, that we can't even, literally that we cannot even think of right now. So I think that's the, the biggest thing. So I feel like we're doing like a locals Q&A here. It's kind of fun. So um, my question is for you. I got into a huge argument with my husband's aunt, diehard Trump supporter. Like, thought I was absolutely insane for saying anything about supporting DeSantis. So I guess my question is, people, like that tribal kind of thing that's happening, even in the Republican Party, how do we get past this? Because even the argument we had was like, I felt like I was fighting with somebody on the left. Yeah, yeah. It was very, yeah. Like, nope, you, you're stupid. And it was weird, and I've never seen that before. I, I can feel this happening. I suspect some of you guys can feel it too, because what I'm getting now, having traveled a little bit more lately, um, I'm hearing a lot of this, uh, that you know, a certain amount of people, everyone's kind of very appreciative, not kind of, very appreciative of what Trump did. We, we owe this guy a debt of gratitude. He woke an awful lot of people up and fought and fought and fought and did things that, that most of us would not have done, you know, and he did nasty things that, that, that did change the equation. At that debate against Hillary, when he brought the, what was it, seven women who accused Bill Clinton of rape? Like, you may not like that, and you might think that was a low blow, but, you know, raping women is a low blow. And, and he fought fire with fire, and I think he opened up so much of the ability to see what I think many of us now see. Uh, that being said, my answer to the previous question about competency and, and communication, um, it's going to get nasty. There is, it's unfortunate. I don't think it has to be. I tried, I mean, I was trying for months and I'll continue to try on my show. Um, and I know that Trump at least ancillarily watches or knows of my show and whatever. It's like, there's a way to do this nicely. Like, imagine if Trump was like, you know, I'll go out and do all the rallies. I will get out there and fight for America and I'll even travel the world and fight for the policies. But, but, but the best guy to take over the reins right now, who's half my age, who's in the prime and ready to go, and all of those things, it's this guy. And I happen to live in his state, and I endorsed him twice. Like, there's so many ways that the end of this story is pleasant. Unfortunately, I don't know that we can get to that ending, but, it, but it's on Trump. Um, so, yeah. Let me start by saying thank you for coming here. I love your show. We, we love to watch you all the time. Thanks. Um, so I guess my question is, in the beginning you said part of the problem is getting competent or getting people into office to do the job. And I've been involved in politics behind the scenes since I was 19. So I've seen the ugly, the dirty, and the behind. And my question is, people go into it with great intentions. And then 40 years later, <laughs> they're as entwined like a Mitch McConnell or a Biden. And the money then turns what they went there to do into what 
is most productive for them and their family. How do we get those limits? How do we get the ugly, the bought, and the bad out of politics so we can have the good politicians doing a good job like our Senator Johnson there? He's just fighting. But I think like President Trump, he didn't need their money, and that's why he was able to stand for what he believed. He had his, you know, he has his secrets in his closet, but they couldn't buy him out. How do we get those people willing to stand up and fight the good fight? You know, it's interesting because I, don't, I actually don't think it's just simply the money that changes these people. Once you get to D.C. and you're around a culture of these people and you're around the TV people and you're around all that, you just start, you know, it's groupthink. You just start being around a system. You're in a swamp. D.C. is literally a swamp, but then it figuratively becomes a swamp too. So I don't think it's always, you know, I think the, the sort of, the easy version of it is somehow that everyone's just paid off to do all of these things. But I think there's a psychological component too, which we all are, we all succumb to. If you start being around a certain set of people and it feels kind of cool and you go into nice restaurants and da 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 do, you might start shaving off the truth a little bit here and there. Uh, but, but you're completely right on that Trump went in, he did not need things from these people, he had fought these people. You know, he had fought all of the regulators in New York City to build buildings. Actually, in my book, I tell the story about how the New York City had this incredible uh, ice skating rink for many years that they got rid of. And then Trump, nobody could do it. It was going to cost $100 million and all this nonsense. Trump was like, I'll buy it. I'll do it in two years. He did. He did it like an eighth of the price. And he just did it. You know, he just went ahead and did it. So again, for my frustrations with him right now, the the... The work and the importance of what he did should not be uh, easily dismissed. How do we really deal with that? I mean, it, it, it's the problem that sits, the, the woke thing is I think the biggest psychological and sort of systemic problem we have, meaning it's in all of our institutions now. This issue about, uh, well, term limits. I, I mean, the easy one I can give you is term limits. These people should have two terms, that's it, you gotta go. You got to go. You can take another job in government. You can be senator for two terms. And then if you want to be governor, OK, so be it. Or you want to be a congressman or the other way around. That probably is really the only way we can do it. The idea that Joe Biden, who when he became president, was 47 years in government. I mean, think about it. Barack Obama came in with hope and change, right? Everybody before me was, was wrong and backwards and mean and whatever. And then he chose a vice president who had been in the machine for 40 years, who became a millionaire in the machine, and suddenly all of his relatives also became millionaires, very bizarre. Bernie became a millionaire with three houses. It's really weird how these people all become millionaires when they're only making about 200 grand a year. Um, term limits, I would say, and, and enough, of us, enough of us pushing them however we can to, to not just, you know, spend more time in the home districts. You know, one of the reasons that, they, that the Democrats really want D.C. statehood. Well, they want it because they'll get electoral votes. But it's also the more that you force people into D.C., it was never designed to be that way. They wanted people, Congress people and senators, to live in your home state, live in your district, spend most of your time there. You come to D.C. to vote. It's become completely the reverse. These people are spending all of their time in the belly of the beast. And, and that needs to be reversed. So D.C. statehood absolutely should not happen. My question is, how do you fix the problem of, for instance, Minnesota being mostly conservative, except for Minneapolis and St. Paul? Wisconsin being mostly conservative, except for Madison and Milwaukee. Chicago is destroying Illinois, which is mostly conservative. What can anybody do about the bigger cities controlling the state? Yeah. And the other thing I just want to say is my third grade teacher was Sister Michael. <laughs> um, you know, I, I can actually give you some positivity on that question. Well, first I would say that the, the difference between big cities and the rural areas, that tension has always existed, always existed. As I said, I grew up in New York. You know, there was always a constant tension between the amount of resources that were going to New York City metropolitan area, which had about 8 million people, versus going to upstate New York where they were growing all the food and, and there was a whole other 
uh, industry going on there, but they were getting far less resources, and there was always that tension. You guys have it here. They have it, obviously, in Illinois. They have that everywhere. I can tell you, having traveled a lot over the last couple of years, uh, despite COVID, I mean, this is happening in every blue city. Minneapolis is a disaster. Chicago is a disaster. We, it's a running joke on my show on Monday mornings talking about, it's not funny, but it's become a joke in a certain sense, how many people were shot in Chicago this week. And it ends up being usually about, it's probably about 12 to 20 homicides a weekend and about 100 people shot. And nobody wants to talk about it because there's a racial component to it that doesn't fit the equation that the media likes to run with. Uh, I was in San Francisco. Some of you probably saw some of the videos. I went, I went to meet Elon Musk at Twitter and I'm upstairs with literally the world's richest man, and you go downstairs, and it is a zombie apocalypse. It looks like uh, The Walking Dead out there because the fentanyl, and now they've mixed other stuff in it. These people, they are they they genuinely do not look human. It is a it is a crisis beyond imagination. But there's a reason for it. The the big cities, the people that become powerful in big cities, they they are just offering control because you need more laws in cities. You have more people in more concentrated areas, and then that thing just grows and grows and grows. You throw a little wokeness into it, and next thing you know, you have DAs who are, in many cases, funded by Soros, who don't want to put people in jail, who, you know, one of the first things that, uh, that Bill de Blasio, who was the former mayor of New York City before Eric Adams right now, he said, we're not gonna prosecute you if you jump the turnstile to go in the subway. And think what that does. It's a two-pronged issue with that. You're doing two things. First off, you're incentivizing criminals, right? You're actually incentivizing people to just not pay, and then that degrades the system over time, and you have less money to potentially do good things. But then you're also saying to all of the decent law-abiding citizens, you're suckers. You suckers. Look at you. Paying to ride the subway? Anyway, all of these problems, whether it's crime, these petty things, you know, the first thing that Rudy Giuliani did when he became mayor of New York in, uh, what was it, about 99 or so, uh, the first thing that he did was he got rid of the homeless guys that would stand in front of the Midtown Tunnel, so all the suburban people were coming through the tunnel, and they would get in traffic there, and these guys would come, and they'd have their spray bottles and newspapers, and they'd be wiping you down, uh, wiping down your car. And it, it's not as if that's the worst crime that imaginable, but he said that quality of life crime will leak into absolutely everything else. And, that, and he did that, and then next thing you know, New York City had 20 great years until de Blasio took over, even under Bloomberg, who was a little more of a lefty. But yes, virtually every state has this insane tension now where the cities are deeply blue and the rural areas where most of the productivity is actually are, it's not even that they're red, they're just kind of sane. And, and that tension, that tension is, uh, it's becoming a huge, huge problem. I don't know how we solve for that, but the, the good note on that is people, good people are leaving the cities. They are leaving the cities in droves, and it may just be that what you all remember from the first time you visited New York City or any other big city or when you went to San Francisco or wherever, like that magical thing of, of what was sold to us through Hollywood or whatever, and some of, to some degree it was true, it just may not exist anymore. When I go back to New York City now, I was there a couple weeks ago doing Gutfeld. I walked by my old apartment. It's not the it's the shell of the city. It's it's a ghost of a city. That's what it feels like. Um, they've legalized. Look, I'm not even. I'm more libertarian in this, so I'm actually okay with legalizing marijuana, for example. But then you see what happens on the other side. The whole city smells like weed now, and everybody's there's no business people anymore. Uh, so they've degraded the cities to such an extent that that tension exists. But the silver lining is you just shouldn't live in the cities, for now at least. Maybe there'll be some, you know, everyone always says, well, what's rock bottom? I don't know what rock bottom is. I mean, you know, we had a lot of cities burning for a whole summer, and, and that didn't appear to be rock bottom. But I would say you just have to move out of the cities. Yeah. There we go. The thing that I'm most angry is about is the left has stole my God-fearing children that I raised. They went to university, and to a Catholic university, Notre Dame, and that is, they're dividing families. And I have very little hope in this younger, because the, the universities are taking over our children. And what can we do, you know, besides stopping them from going to a university, 
um, besides they're very intelligent people, very lovely people, but they still have this left mentality now, and they weren't raised like that. It's a big one. I mean, that it's sort of the right way to end a Q&A because it sums up so much what's going on here because it's tearing families apart. I have the same tensions in my family, and then you throw COVID on top of that, and, and everyone, I have no doubt everyone in this room has that, where suddenly my family was really good about arguing about politics. We really were good. I, I grew up, I wrote about it in my first book, that my family, we could argue about we'd, every holiday. We'd have 30, 40 people big table, kids at a different table. I'm the, young, I'm the oldest of my generation, so I was always trying to get to the adult table. I didn't even know what they were talking about, but I know everybody was kind of yelling and whatever, and I was like, I just want to sit there and see what's going on, and they were always, literally everything. I remember my, I remember my aunts arguing about abortion, arguing about taxes, and, and I think a lot of that must have seeped into me somehow, and, and I can tell you, my family does not do it anymore. Usually when people, even when everyone comes to my house, and I, and I like to host, um, you know, we, we love to cook for everybody and, and, you know, we've been afforded a nice life so I can bring everybody and they can stay and all that. And it's gotten very difficult. There's always a moment now where something about politics will start and everyone is kind of now, well, let's talk about something else. Oh, it's well, it's warm in Florida. Let's talk about that for a while. You know, and, and so they've done something very twisted to families and I don't know I, you know, I'm, I'm a father to two very, very young kids now, and I think about it a lot because it's going to be a, a real challenge. I, can only, I, I, I have great sympathy for what you're talking about. I can only imagine uh, what that is, and, and we all know it to different degrees. And that's why the, the school thing is so twisted. But, but again, to do the silver lining version of this, look what happened in Virginia. Um, uh, uh, not uh, Duncan, sorry. Um, I was up at 4 a.m. to get here this morning, so you have to bear with me. Um, Youngkin was not supposed to win that election, right? McAuliffe was supposed to win that thing. And then with about three days left, Youngkin finally leaned into the parent stuff, and it, it got him a win. And now Virginia is doing school choice. I just had, we haven't aired it yet, but I interviewed Kim Reynolds from Iowa, governor of Iowa, a couple of days ago. She's leading on school choice, which they're doing now there. Uh, Sarah Huckabee Sanders in Arkansas, school choice. Florida tonight, I just heard it about a half hour before we started, has finally done it. We knew DeSantis was gonna do it, but I think he wanted to give room for some other states to do it first. School choice, meaning that they're gonna fund students instead of systems. Um, so it's not the perfect answer for what you can do internally in your home, and, and nobody has that answer, but you have to just kinda slog through it. Um, but, I, but that's why you just, the idea again that you would send your kid to a school, they'd be talking to teachers about, my oldest son is Justin, if I was to find out when he was seven years old that it turns out that second grade teacher for three months has been calling him Justine, think about it, but this is happening, it's happening. And, and then, so all you can do is figure out Okay, we live in a crazy system, and how do I how do I decrazy my life? That that's really all you can do. What an unbelievably wonderful night! I mean, we've spent an hour and a half. Wow, it's un unbelievable. So, oh. wow, it, it's really quite crazy. I want to. I'm not sure if Chancellor Alexander is still here. Is is the chan Chancellor's back there? Bless your heart, Chancellor, and thank you for being our host tonight and for everything that you do. Um, it's remarkable. Alex, for your leadership at the center, um, I tell you, you know what the governor thinks of you, and you're doing just one hell of a job there to keep us moving forward, and uh, it's quite something. <laughs> Speaking of moving forward, Ruth Brash is, Ruth Brash puts the starch in this thing, I'll tell you. She really makes sure that the trains run on time and that everybody gets where they need to go. And uh, she's, you know, we're very, very lucky to have Ruth, I'll tell you. Um, <laughs> lastly, to each and every one of you, um, you know, the Thompson Center does its level best to bring thoughtful opportunities to the community, to students, um, to faculty, to administrators and leadership. And 
your willingness to come out tonight and participate in this is absolutely the reason that we spend the time doing what we're doing. And the opportunity to have somebody come up from Florida who's nationally recognized as a thought leader, and not only a thought leader, but a leader in thinking, which is different. <laughs> it's very different. And uh, for him to, you know, come to fly over country, I think is, uh, we're very, very fortunate to have him here. And it's a testament to, I think, you know, what Governor Thompson stands for, what he continues to do, and uh, being a thinking, thoughtful person. And your demonstration of that by your very presence here tonight means a great deal. So um, I think it's only fair to let our very special guest uh, give us his last thoughts and uh, you, you will travel safely and we'll all see you again soon. Oh, I have to say, uh, is it just me or has the vibe in this room been really wonderful for the last hour and a half, right? Right, it's, it, yeah, yeah, that's Wisconsin I suppose. There really has been a nice vibe. I, I, I just realized, you know, I've been sitting this whole time, and usually when I, when I speak in front of groups, you, you stand, right? You, you stand in front of people, and there was just something nice. Uh, you guys, I could see. Nobody really looked at their phone this entire time. I saw a lot of smiles, a lot of nods. I saw some frustration. I saw some tears. We can get through this thing. We really can, but it is going to take all of us uh, just being a bit of a better version of ourselves to do it. I don't know exactly what that means. But I think we can, we can figure this out. The, the massive fight that is coming that nobody wants between Trump and DeSantis. And again, that's just a political issue. But all of the stuff, we, we can do this, but, but we have to realize that you have some, you have some piece of that. You know, I don't know how many of you know the, the NPC meme, uh, NPC non-playable characters. This is in video games. You know, you're the main character, but then you meet all of these characters that are, you know, computer-generated characters. They can't. They can only walk this way or this way or this way or this way or do one or two things. And there's a meme out there that that there's a lot of NPC people out there now that they are just these programmed people who cannot think for themselves, who cannot, you know, actually come up with a, not even an original thought, but just anything that is outside of whatever the mainstream group think is. And, and if we do our best to not do that and figure out how to have those conversations at the table uh, with, with family members, and I, trust me, I'm speaking to myself. I have had a lot of stuff mostly related to COVID in my family in the last year. I did not get vaxxed, and that caused uh, unbelievable uh, you know, pain points in my family. And ironically, I'm not getting any apologies for it now, now that it's all kind of turned around. <laughs> I'll, tell you something, I'll tell you something funny just to end with. Um, so now, so we've been, because we have the two kids now, aunts and uncles and grandparents coming, and everyone in my family is vaxxed except for me. And, um, you know, now we're serving food buffet style, and everyone's sharing forks and ice cream and, you know, people that wouldn't see anyone for years, and it was just so insane. And I'm watching everybody eat, and I'm like, do you know, that spoon was just in my mouth. Does anyone want to apologize? Does anyone, or does, it's not even, I, truly, it's not even the apology. I'm sure many of you feel this too. I don't need an apology. I would just like somebody to be like, oh, I guess I was a little testy for the last couple of years. <laughs> something, like give us a little bit of something, but, but you can't wait around for that. That's the point. You can't wait around for that, but what you can do is figure out what your role in all of this is and, and fight a little bit harder. And, uh, and sir, I have to tell you this entire time with the beard right here, I've been looking at you this entire time thinking you're Dr. Robert Malone. Do you guys know Dr. <laughs> Dr. Robert Malone who created the mRNA vaccine and is now, is now like the biggest anti-vaxxer there is. I've been thinking half the time I was like, man, Malone's here, what am I doing up here? Uh, but really, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you guys and I appreciate everybody for, for bringing me down and, and asking good questions and uh, and I thank you for having me here, and I'll keep fighting in the free state of Florida.